Welcome everyone, this is lecture 28 of this series of lectures on fluids and electrolytes. This series explains my book, Manual of Fluid, Electrolyte, and Acid-Based Disorders, A Pathophysiologic Approach to Common Clinical Problems. I'm Dr. Mohamed Kinawi. I'm a nephrologist in Northwest Indiana. This is my book. I'll provide a link to uh, how you can buy it on Amazon. We are in the final lecture of Chapter 3. We are going to do case studies in hyperkalemia. Case number one, severe hyperkalemia. A 60-year-old man with CKD3 due to diabetic nephropathy comes with a creatinine of 1.9 and a potassium of 4.7. He's on lisinopril 10 mg daily. As part of his blood pressure management, he was instructed on a low-sodium diet. After three weeks, he comes in with generalized muscle weakness and a potassium of 7.1. EKG shows peak T waves. What happened? This patient is prone to hyperkalemia. He has diabetic nephropathy, which is commonly associated with hyporeninemic hypoaldosteronism syndrome. He has CKD3. He's already on an ACE inhibitor. Moreover, after he was told about low-sodium diet, he started using a potassium-containing salt substitute. These potassium-containing salt substitutes contain 13.6 mil equivalents of potassium chloride per gram, so 3 grams which is half a teaspoon, is equivalent to 40 mil equivalents of KCL. So mystery is solved. This is severe hyperkalemia due to salt substitute in someone with CKD and diabetic kidney disease. Potassium and diet, case number two. A 40-year-old woman with a potassium of 5, normal kidney function, body weight of 70, has an estimated excess cellular potassium content of 70 mil equivalent. This is whole body potassium content. She eats a large bowl of fruits. After two hours, her potassium is only 5.2. How come? If potassium content of the fruits she ate is 35, why did not her serum potassium increase by 50% to 7.5? This is half of her total body potassium. Now, that would have resulted in life-threatening hyperkalemia. So why does that not happen. Carbohydrates in fruits will increase insulin release from the pancreas. Insulin will drive potassium intracellularly until it is dealt with, until it is excreted by the kidneys. This prevents severe hyperkalemia in people with normal kidney function, even if their intake of potassium is really high. This doesn't happen in someone with advanced chronic kidney disease, stage 4 or 5, and someone on renal replacement therapy. Case number three, hyperkalemic emergency. Here we have a 45-year-old man with a potassium of 6.1 due to rhabdomyolysis. He was given the usual insulin, glucose, albuterol, sodium bicarb, IV fluids, loop diuretic. After two hours, his potassium is repeated. Now it's eight. EKG changes are noted. He has peaked T waves. What do you do? We repeat everything we talked about. So we uh, give him now calcium gluconate because we have peaked T waves. We also have to give him the insulin, the glucose, the bicarb, the loop diuretic, the albuterol, but we have to prepare for hemodialysis. So we need stat hemodialysis. Hemodialysis is life-saving in this case. Otherwise, you are going to end up with a mortality. Case number four, hyperkalemia CHF. Here we have a 72-year-old woman with chronic systolic congestive heart failure. The patient's ejection fraction is 25%. She's on lisinopril 40 a day, spironolactone 25 milligrams a day, furosemide 40 milligrams twice a day, carvitolol 25 milligrams, BID. Blood pressure control is optimal. Creatinine is stable at 2.4, but potassium is 6. The patient was placed on low potassium diet, but her potassium is still 6. Should we stop maybe spironolactone and discontinue the lisinopril or reduce the dose of lisinopril? The answer is no. She's on optimized medical regimen for chronic systolic CHF. 
if we do dose reduction or discontinuation of medication, we are going to have increased mortality, and that was studied, actually. So this patient is a good candidate, not only for a low-potassium diet, but also for a newer for the newer potassium binders, pterimer, beltasa, or sodium zirconium cyclosilicate, or localma. Now, this is a case of KX late postoperatively, SPS. Here we have a 47-year-old man with CKD secondary to diabetic nephropathy. He was seen in the second postoperative day after an open cholecystectomy. He's MPO, he has an ileus. He's on lactated ringer IV fluids. His serum creatine is stable at 3.1. Potassium is 6.1. He's asking if he should get a dose of kx sodium polystyrene sulfonate. He's taken that in the past with no problem. Should we give him kx No, we should not give him kx It's contraindicated. Postoperative hyperkalemia should never be treated with SPS, with kx nor binders should not be used either. We don't have data, and I don't think it's a good idea. In this patient, stop the lactated ringer because it has some potassium. Give him isotonic saline instead, and do what you normally do for hyperkalemia. You can give the fluids. You can give furosemide. If uh, uh, you have severe hyperkalemia, then you can use, like we talked about, the insulin, the glucose, the uh, albuterol, uh, etc. But you should not give KXLA or any, any potassium binder for that matter. Now, we have confirmed reports of intestinal and colon, colon necrosis due to k SPS, and the FDA has warned against use of SPS in patients who do not have normal bowel function. Now, some people said that the uh, necrosis is due to sorbitol. I don't think you want to take that chance. Case number six. Hyporeninemic hypoaldosteronism. Here we have a 61-year-old woman with CKD3 due to diabetic nephropathy. She has chronic hyperkalemia due to hyporeninemic hypoaldosteronism syndrome. This is, like we said, type 4 renal tubular acidosis. Her blood pressure is 152 over 91, so it is high. She's on a calcium channel blocker, beta blocker. She's on a loop diuretic and hydralazine. Her potassium has been in the range of 5.8 to 6.2, so she has chronic hyperkalemia. Even though she's on a low potassium diet, she's on a strict low potassium diet, should we give her fludrocortisone? I mean, she has hyporeninemic hypoaldosteronism. She has type 4 RTA, and fludrocortisone is like aldosterone, so it's going to cause so it's going to cause potassium excretion. This would be the treatment. Should we do it? Not really. Fludrocortisol may lead to improvement in hyperkalemia, but it's rarely used. Why? Because it causes fluid retention and hypertension. So it's not a good choice. It has aldosterone-like effect. It's fludrocortisone, so it's a mineralocorticoid. It's going to cause sodium retention, therefore high blood pressure, and potassium excretion. So most of the times, unfortunately, we cannot use it. So what do we do? We continue the low potassium diet, and we have to use the newer potassium binders, such as pterimer and sodium zirconium cyclosilicate. Now, uh, if optimal uh, potassium control is achieved, then she can be started on an ACE on an ARB, which are indicated for this patient with diabetic nephropathy and can result in optimal blood pressure control. Now, I have to say something when I say start potassium binder. If the patient is on, say, lisinopril, spironolactone, and they're hyperkalemic now, you have to hold the medicine until the patient can go to the pharmacy, sometimes a specialty pharmacy, get their insurance approved, and get that binder. So, uh, so that has to be clear because sometimes it's a week before they get the binder. You don't want them to continue to take a medicine that is causing significant hyperkalemia and they're not covered. So uh, this has to be uh, clarified. Now, this actually concludes our lectures on hyperkalemia. Uh, in the next lecture, we are going to discuss potassium binders. See you then.